Hello, this is the November 9th Beehive call. We have Vitaly, Andrew, Jan, Pat, Daniel, Chris, John, and myself, Michael. Others may join us. Uh, I have some news. The FreeBSD Vendor Summit was great with great energy and just a really balanced real world look at the state of things. So the video should be out next week. Check those out. Um, there has been a time change here on the West Coast, and I see a few people joined an hour earlier. My apologies to Europeans who may not have experienced that. Small news, I have uh, verified that the basics of FreeBSD Zen is working on 14.0 RC4. Antoneg and Jan have been working quite hard on some nifty process supervision with Beehive. Uh, if Antoneg rolls in, he'll probably have a demo. I have been busy re-rolling Windows ISOs for installation such that they are uh, touch-free is one of the terms, perhaps, or hands-off. I know, Andrew, your organization does that, and uh, Daniel, you have probably done that over the years. So I'm happy to talk about those subjects. And uh, Chris, I know you've posted this document. I don't know if you're allowing people to edit it individually, but I couldn't edit it, so I threw in a bunch of comments. But I'm more than happy to run through the point. I'm going to open it. Repeat that. I'm going to open it up. Thank you for uh, for the feedback. Yeah, sorry okay, about cool. that. And I will join you with video there. So uh, appreciate it. And uh, do you know? Have you has been Vermin been joining calls or just commenting through the doc? He's got quite a few on there, and I wanted, I've added some comments wondering about the use cases for some things like converting from jail to beehive and beehive to jail, because that can be interpreted a few different ways. Yeah, that input was sent in by Vermaiden on the Enterprise Working Group uh, mailing list. Uh, I suppose uh, the best way to resolve those questions is probably to invite him to one of the calls and just, you know. Sure. Ask him what he meant there. by that. Okay, Unfortunately, excellent. I don't have a whole lot more to go on uh, than what was said by him on the on the mailing list. I don't know if you have access to that because I can let me forward that email. Maybe you can make sense of it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. I see that a new Omni OS has landed. I am impressed to see that they have uh, beehive images, they have raw images, they have a whole lot of new installation formats. Is that on your radar? Do you have a migration plan, upgrade plan? Um, no. <laughs> and that said, uh, have you been, as our resident expert on Omni OS, are there any key features that should be on our radar? Because congratulations to the team to getting that out. Um. I don't usually track the, the, the stables. I usually track the long terms. Okay. So I don't ah, know. And they ping pong between the two, correct? Yeah, I want to say every, maybe it's third, fourth. I, I don't remember how, okay. but periodically one of them just is a long-term stable instead of a stable. Got it. So release schedule. Yeah, the L the LTS is last for um oh there's a the long term. Okay, so the last was the four six and we're on four eight. Now everyone, here's the secret. Click on other stable downloads and you suddenly see uh Z standard encrypt uh, compressed beehive either send streams or images. You have a raw image, which came up nicely under uh, Beehive on FreeBSD. Uh, I could not get it to work on hardware, although the FreeBSD and Debian images, raw images will work on hardware. So I will reach out accordingly for that. Uh, anyway, so that was a pleasant surprise. Congratulations to that team. And hopefully that has some features that rock your worlds. And for what it's worth, do they have a brief narrative on the amazing new features of Omni OS 48, is it? 
Uh, I've got the release notes. Uh, sure. It just, I'll post just them. Go through them. You did. I'll, I'll just. I'll, well, no, I said I will. Okay. In one second. I'll the release notes are up of there. I see the oh, word release there you go. Um, notes. I just did straight to the link. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's just. I uh, you know, I really want to see this stay a you know, tier one beehive platform. So let's take a quick look through them. GCC, I have heard of it. Zen 4 CPU support. Okay. This supports improved. That's interesting. Not to us, but to me. Mm -hmm. In kernel SIFS SMB, this, uh, Chris, this definitely came up with the uh, Enterprise Working Group, and they've had their own implementation for some time. So it might be worth taking a peek at what they're doing. I use uh, that. It's nice. What level yeah. of SMB will that support? Oh. 1.0 or? <laughs> at least three. 1990, at least three. 3.1, okay. I think. Yeah, I know that I have no problem using it, using it on any of my domains. Okay. So. And full domain join and have a nice day. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Is that documented anywhere? I would love to see those notes. Because if, I mean, that's a compelling feature that shouldn't be a secret, just saying. Uh, what can you tell us about Lofi 4D? Because Not a lot. That's lower than than me okay uh it is a storage question discard trim that's good because that's been slow to arrive in certain environments uh sm bios 31 okay uh which command ld do, 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 do. there's some beehive stuff in here yeah let's take a look do, 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 do. zones Experimental EMU brand zone for emulated systems under QEMU. Interesting. Okay. Uh, 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 bug fix. Beehive. Faster page table popul population. Yawn, higher performance networking. I'm curious how yet better that got, because it's quite good. Actually, the first one's probably pretty interesting to me. Yep, please. The, the anything that improves boot times, because mm -hmm. um, uh, we've got some systems that have like 50 to 100 beehive zones on them. And um, when the machines reboot, the service that starts them times out. Right. I recall that issue. Now, are you putting them in sequence just to prevent pain and suffering, or do they just try to all, you know, uh, what's the term? It, it's a, it, it's the built in daemon. I think it just tries to pull them all up at once. I see. So I assume that it makes sense for the page tables because you're bound to have at least as many CPUs as you're running guests unless you're doing something you shouldn't in production. Yeah, we're not over-provisioning so that, that host. Have the page table initialization, basically do a big allocation, then have it happen. So yeah, there's no reason why you should delay that. For the disk IO, you may want to then sequence the start up a bit so that you don't have a thundering herd of random IOs. Uh, you don't want, which would delay the boot, just a bit of concurrency control on I.O., but I don't see how it's, it's basically forcing the memory allocation to happen sequentially improves uh, initialization performance a lot. Additional support for ATA pass-through and yeah, so NVMe. And Grub is out of here. It's like, yep, free BC loader. For those who celebrate, uh, ATA pass through. Uh, do, 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 enable a smart control. Okay, yeah, nice. Yeah, the BSD loader has been the better option, so basically since it was added. Excellent. It really has been so much nicer. Um, I think Chelsea CXG BE. That's a good thing. 
Okay, well, this is good. I will drop those beehive notes in the minutes because this is all good. SSH package changes, not too worried. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, I suppose it's time to spin that up. Again, I did spin it up without issue under Beehive on FreeBSD, but uh, that's worthy of its own hardware. So congratulations on that release on the OS. Um, let's see if this works happily based and boom, it worked. Okay. Uh, Pat, you have a question. Uh, how are people accessing files on the guest to install a new kernel? Uh, mount the image and others NFS. What are people typically doing? Let's see if there are answers to that. And is that purely FreeBSD to FreeBSD or say a Linux VM where you're, you know, post for now it's for, like for now it's FreeBSD to FreeBSD. Okay. And are your host and VMs in sync with version or are they very different versions? No, it's like, a, I think like a 13.2 host and a current guest. So can you describe what you want to accomplish? Yeah, so I want to build current on my host and yeah. deploy it to the guest and, and upgrade so, the guest over time. So there's one thing to watch out for, and that is that uh, most file system and partition table stuff isn't really written with the assumption of malicious uh, disks or malicious disk content. So for example, UFS will kind of panic if you give it a sufficiently cleverly corrupted file system. And other operating systems may con get be confusing to FreeBSD or the other way around. And if you have multiple instances of the same images from the release process, uh, and they are available with um, geom uh, tasting of your Z vault, then you have conflicting definitions for your labels and so on for the device by label uh, handling inside geom. So uh, and that is out of the way that we don't trust anything a guest has written to on the host if if it's a security boundary for you. If it's only a compatibility fix so that you can run the newer FreeBSD on the older one and you see it's all as one trust domain, then okay, it's not a big problem. Next step I would do is if you just want to make it available, the easiest way would be to uh, make the resulting uh, disk images available as read only uh, images to the guest. Uh, if it should be hot pluggable, uh, then you have to go for VIT or SCSI in FreeBSD. Otherwise, if it doesn't have to be hot pluggable and the guest is expected to be rebooted anyway, then you can just use any method to pass the re resulting ISO or disk image or whatever to the guest. Uh, if Pat, you want you modifying... a shared writable uh, directory, the right now best way is just an NFS service on a dedicated uh, tab interface. Uh, so uh, in that case, I would use VMNet, but because uh, tab interfaces go link down if they are closed, whereas uh, VMNet stays up and the link down triggers the kernel to remove the route, so you would have to reconfigure the for a host direct host to guest network without bridge so that the NFS server is isolated from the rest of your network. So you do that, then the problem is if you just use tap, basically every time the guest shut down, shuts down, the host side of the tap interface gets deconfigured from the routing point of view, which is annoying. And if it just stays up because you use the different name for tap interfaces, then it works as expected. Okay. Um, Pat, are you modifying base when you build it or would a snapshot do? There are weekly snapshots. They now have ZFS for what it's worth if you want ZFS on ZFS. But um, 
Uh, no, this is like, this is, I'm modifying the source code and I'm trying to test changes. Okay, cool. I'm suggesting to try to 9P first solution. Oh, I, didn't try, I didn't try to update the SVM, yeah. but uh, it could be used to share a uh, full system from host to guests and you can directly to uh, run make kernel install for example in guest did you try it would you try it uh yeah i can definitely look into that yeah i think to jan's point earlier for me this is about compatibility not a security boundary so i'm this is me running vms um you know where i know the I'm I'm just building the source code and like building patches from reviews and stuff to be able to test them out. So this isn't like a untrusted guest. Um, just if I remember correctly, the GPXE uh, code is available via pods or packages. So uh, how about just using the GPXE inside Beehive to do an HTTP boot from just an HTTP file server? So use the UEFI boot code to chain boot into a re tiny little read only uh, GPXE payload, which then uh, does an HTTP boot from the ZIO uh, network driver. Yeah, uh, that would be, cool. be very not... easy to host. And the uh, for unless you want to persist the result, it could be completely stateless. Uh, would be nice, but mm -hmm. I haven't tried in a while if this GPXE or IPXE, I don't know which one I tried, which one worked better, but if this still works inside of Beehive, it used to at least. Yeah, it looks like, so I GPXE is broken and deprecated and expired, but IPXE is recently updated. So IPXE looks to be currently maintained. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I tried it to, and it was just funny to see it boot. If you don't care about security, you could really just point it at the, the public HTTP mirrors hmm. and see it boot. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that would actually be, I'll, I'll try that. That sounds like it would be really cool for my kind of development case. Because what I'm because what I'm really trying to get to is like a really nice workflow for being able to try different patches um on the review site and be able to you know just pull down some patches because it sounds like quickly. something which would if you get it working it would be optimal for this kind of automated workflow because you don't have to do a bunch of storage you could just basically create a new uh zvol and empty one have it auto install on that and yeah Just check which files are included in the uh, package. And then it could just do a fully automated install to the MFR of Zvol or something, or even a memory disk if you want to, um, if you have the memory and want to basically avoid any IO bottlenecks, which are avoidable. And you say you tried this some time ago? Yes, uh, some you time document it? No, it was just a one shot idea. Didn't do much with it. I just let's see if this works in Beehive. Yeah, it, okay. It Excellent. boots, it tries, it find. it gets a DHCP address. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you can okay. push the uh, boot URL via uh, DHCP. That is worth investigating and. Pat, one can and do if it. If I remember correctly, you can basically. So go ahead, Jan. Do a, if you run your own HTTP server, you can also have the HTTP server basically do the opposite thing and have it decide what to uh, return to the client so that you, instead of basically pushing a configuration to your client, your server knows which client is supposed to boot which image which may be easier to automate your HTTP server than to automate uh, your 
guests so that you could have a unified configuration for different and then with the yeah your yeah that's a that's a really cool idea one i guess does that um yeah i'll i'll just try that cuz i mean this is i guess what i'm curious about that is that seems like it's is that just like the bootloader and kernel cuz there's also the you know world i'm doing build kernel build world and ultimately trying to get you know, just boot a new Beehive VM using a newly built kernel and world. So you're saying this IPXE, I'd be able to do that over a network? Uh, you're able to boot off a network by having it allocate enough memory to basically do download the image to, uh, to memory and then boot off a RAM disk. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll try that. That sounds really cool. John, is the IBFT indeed the iSCSI or root? I'm guessing. Uh, I think that's a protocol to hand over the. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure, but if I remember correctly, it's the protocol to basically hand hand over the TCP connection information and iSCSI session state so that the bootloader uh, uh, iSCSI session can be continued by the uh, kernel. That is so correct. You can have your uh, root uh, lock device via iSCSI. There is the IS boot kernel module uh, for FreeBSD and ports, which I think kind of implements this. Never really used it. Uh, attempting idea, but it has been broken before. But all I have a big kernel network stack change, and then someone has to. Yep find it useful enough to uh, bring it up again because it isn't a uh, part of base. Maybe we can, should revisit that if it, we can uh, basically import the code because then it would be in sync with the kernel and wouldn't rot away anytime the kernel network stack changes because the fixes are normally tiny, but not yeah. obvious to someone who hasn't modified that part of the network set. Is this fundamentally unrelated to IPXE and you could do it with other boot payloads? So, um, so IP, IPXE can be programmed to in, to create the, uh, the, the IBFT uh, marker in low core, yep. which is what gets searched for by the IS boot package. Uh, but the IS boot package in ports has issues. Uh, yeah, so the problem is that you have uh, lots of tiny little bootloader st stages. The yeah. first thing that ha happens is, for example, inside Beehive, you run the normal uh, UEFI boot module that can not boot support things which are too complicated to boot from. So you would then chain from that to IPXE and it can be an IBFT, uh, I don't know the terminology there, provider, so that it does an iSCSI uh, connection using the credentials which are either hard-coded or uh, also securely distributed via DHCP. Then it and basically hands off the metadata for the kernel to recreate the TCP connection and continue using the same TCP connection and thereby um, iSCSI session so that it can really net root of an iSCSI uh, target. But so I point, use this process for booting Linux systems all over Beehive, the place, but I don't use it for FreeBSD. Um, Beehive has vidIO SCSI and the host has proper iSCSI support. Uh, I would instead have the host uh, use that I or uh, SCSI to basically make it just appear as a SCSI device uh, inside the guest. Okay. And then the host has to deal with the I.O., but it's just a different way to solve the same problem. And Pat, is your guest under the same host or are you doing it over the network in any way, shape, or form? Like 
to start it's on the same host okay. um at some point i may put it over a network or i may have the builder create like a zfs data set and then replicate it over to the host okay so yeah i'm still kind of figuring this stuff out can you hear me michael yeah absolutely yeah. okay sorry oh no no worries uh your wisdom is appreciated here and i see that this was updated in september i tried to use this like 10 years ago <laughs> um but yeah i uh, who's the maintainer uh it uh, a different john okay well it's alive but it's hard to say yeah how practical that is um let's take a look at their repo modified two months ago okay so it's alive at least there's that um perhaps with documentation here there are the ibft loader tunables uh john when did you last try this um about five years ago okay well it's been tickled they are active and for what it's worth there it is it might be worth looking to thank you sure Jeff. okay well that's in encouraging for a long time it was broken in 13. oh i know <laughs> it's like it's one of those tools where it's like oh is it working yet uh not yet uh so yeah um any and all wisdom and experience is appreciated there because that's been a discussion for years and years <clears throat> let's see changing gears if that is that uh daniel have you found a quiet spot or are you still reliving bright lights big city <laughs> it is bright lights big city um uh, near a lot of pigeons none of them have bi questions okay. they're all experts uh, um, could, go ahead no i'm good now are you still virtualizing windows Oh, oodles. oodles. BI, BI is yeah, the the probably the main the main reason I use BI is Windows. There's a couple of edge cases where there's commercial or semi-commercial software in Linux that I use BI for. But yeah, Windows is the is by far the number one reason. Server or workstation? Well, that's a sir, all sir, all, all server. server. There, there's some quasi workstation situations where you know, somebody needs a connector to a to a database on prem, and we'll set up a, a workstation for that. And I also do have some um, RDS server clients. So you know, they they you know they log in and share share desktop. So that's that's so irritating that I think I might actually switch to just you know Windows Windows ten or I guess Windows eleven until uh until i can't get away with it so um, the gateway is giving you trouble rds gateway yeah, yeah so so it comes in two flavors one is where it's basically just a you know just a windows rds server and everybody logs into it at the same time the second flavor the rds server comes comes in is you have to install it on metal and it spins up vms obviously that's not an option for me because i use uh I'm I'm not using Windows on Metal under any circumstances. Right, right. Yeah. So that that first way is a little bit funky. So so certain programs like you know like web browsers and Microsoft Office and stuff like that, all that stuff's going to run absolutely perfectly. Um, but certain things like like QuickBooks and other other funky apps will bump into will sort of bump into itself if you if you try to run it synchronously at the same time on multiple profiles on the same computer. So Interesting. that so the RDS server is yeah, it's it's a it's a bit it's a bit clunky and it's expensive. There's there are also hacks. So you can you can run Windows 10 and then there's a hack that allows you to run multiple RDS uh instances to it and that's somewhat that's pro probably probably legal if not in 
you know, questionable breach of, of Microsoft contract. But overall, I think that the best option is to simply template Windows 10 with ZFS and then use, use their, um, their sysprep tool to just deploy a bunch of them quickly. And that, that, that seems like a better way to handle, handle the desktop. So yeah, so I've got Windows Server in, in a couple of different ways. And then, and then I've, I've definitely had a lot of experience with, with you know, various types of the RDS solutions on, on Beehive. When you said Windows 10 was ZFS, do you mean like Jorgen's code or just on the host? And oh, on, on the host. Right. So okay. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just get that, get like a gold master image and yep. then you boot first time and it asks you for your, you know, name, login information, domain information, et cetera. Yep. And you're, 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 you're on. Cool. Um, is that with yeah. auto on attend XML or? Just prep or no, something? so auto unattend that that's a that's from a gold CD, right? Uh, that's craft your own and make your own. Yes, golden image CD if or right. So you can you can so if you run on any on any Windows Pro Plus machine right now, if you run sysprep, which I think you, I think you have to target the explicit path for mm -hmm. that, it will it will gold master the image. So I then see. you can blast the host ID, the MAC address, uh, clone that um, either onto physical machine. By the way, I've done this with physical machines. So from a beehive gold master onto physical machines, just DD that sucker, DD yep. that sucker right, right over and then, and then boot up and it, and that boots the first time, just like as if you bought a laptop in a store where mm -hmm. it asks you all the all yeah. the startup questions, um, which is really great because then, you know, I have my staff sort of keep those those gold template images up to date, and then, you know, and then we we load them up, we get the licensing sorted out, and we're rolling. Yep. Okay. Well, that might uh, be a conversation to have in parallel, as not everyone's running Windows, but uh, that is heating up in my circles. And I did find that you can, uh, just like the Beehive Windows docs from a long time ago before VNC support, you can tear open the UDF image on FreeBSD with 7P, uh, a 7-zip. You can make that XML file and you can re-roll it with like the make ISO tools and off you go. And it does a completely automated installation right before your eyes. Uh, have you looked at guacamole for what it's worth as an RDP alternative or overlay? Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, really, I think what guacamole does at the end of the day is it's just a, it's just a great web interface. So you can, you can do things clientless. I think that's probably the technology that's used in fancy security tools like um, the FreeBSD based uh, Fudo technology. Okay. Uh, which you know, which will let you remote access in any any imaginable way. It does take some elbow grease to configure. Uh -huh. I, I was I had this I had this dream of creating a beehive control panel based on guacamole. Um, and it it's and basically basically what I got to and of course this is this is for any you know any beehive it would. It would, it would work pretty well, but, and, and then of course it would do the VNC consoles and also the RDP to RDP or VNC to whatever host type it is. So it would have been really cool. What I, what I did find is that the elbow grease making that work, um, you know, the, setting up the config files and, and setting it up, it was for, for me, because I'm not doing it at scale yeah. or massive scale anyway, the, the elbow grease of simply just creating a, you know, a jail with VNC in it, or or a separate or a separate instance of some kind that does VM management was was easier than getting Guacamole working. Now, if you have a large amount of staff and you know wet and need the flexibility of a web console, Guacamole is pretty sweet. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty cool for sure. Um, you know, web access, yeah, web access for anything. 
do, do we have any other anybody else on the call with uh, guacamole practice and maybe had an easier time than I did? No, I just uh, used the Beehive VNC to install Windows and enabled the v uh, RDP server and got rid of VNC. Uh, but that was for a single lab machine, not anything automated. Yeah, this isn't, yeah, it's definitely not limited to, to Windows. You can use guacamole even for the, you know, the console VNC or anything else. It's just sort of a connector of many types of remote control software basically it's a client on steroids is what it is huh. um so yeah I, I mean if we had i think that i think the thing is guacamole is like the tool one would use to cr to help create a bi manager i think that's like if somebody wanted to make an a bi manager that did consoles and did you know click this button to do whatever that would be you know that would be the big time saver would be to you know put put guacamole in as the as the browser based way to access consoles and stuff and then you know one could make a cloud system in the box along with that tool it just was a little bit more work than i wanted to to sure. to set it up for that so i've i've now told my staff you know i'm sorry uh but you have to just type in <laughs> You have to set up the SSH jump to get to the consoles, and yeah. that is, uh, yeah, and you must suffer in that way. Is it tied to VNC, or does it pass through RDP and other protocols? I think it does. I think it does. I think it does RDP and maybe even Spice. So yeah. I don't. So I don't. So I think it. I think it does have some flexibility in. Um, in those areas i know when i, I i've looked yes, at it and i know it does support a number of protocols there, there they are uh that said have you spent time with say xrdp and spice and you know could one of those be bolted into the uefi firmware to give an alternative to vnc based in your experience I don't know. No, I guess I, I guess I haven't. I don't. I think I threw that I, on the wish list of like, well, you know, VNC is a great like crutch <laughs> briefly. Yeah, it's I, I mean, it does it does make me it does make me a little anxious in that, you know, the the only the, the only reasonable sort of consistent way to get to consoles is through this unencrypted protocol, which then you bound, which you which you bind to localhost, and you're stuck with an eight character password. You know, like um, that's the that's 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 nailed into the VNC protocol. So, I mean, so if you if you give somebody local access to your machine, you're you you've got a lot of trust. That you have. And there would be a simple fix by adding Unix socket support to Beehive CNC server, because, for example, recent uh, SSH versions have support to forward uh, to a local Unix domain st stream socket. And, and then so we can set that, the permissions for the right users. Uh, that, that would exactly, actually and be you could use ideal. a force command or other um, mechanisms. To uh, and you could also basically do a jail attached via PAM jail, so that you would basically use PAM exec and PAM uh, jail to validate that what the user is allowed to do, and then uh, or you could write your own module, but uh, realistically speaking, PAM exec to do your custom validation, and then uh, or through a force command, but you can force them to run inside of uh, a jail. If you have this jailed, uh, basically push it into the same jail as an unprivileged user, and then connect. See, that's um, that's perfect because then then I wouldn't be right. Then my backup user doesn't have to have, you know, uh, net, you know, direct access to my VNCs. That would be that would be perfect. That would be that would be perfect. the clean solution. The ugly workaround, which doesn't require changing any uh, C code. Would be to use IPFW or something similar, where matching against local users. 
So it's already bound to the loopback and you could just basically do a, either through Mac or IPFW or I think also for PF you can match for local connections against the user and maybe even group ID. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Well, that's the disgusting. Yeah, exactly. It, it, uh, you're, you're right. It, it's, exactly. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's <laughs> and it's not. You know, and it, it means that my break class in case of emergency to, to get into the console if I need to is to change IPFW rules, which is, you know, irritating. Um, but I, but yeah, I, I've done, I do that with, uh, you know, WireGuard users, yes, but local hosts, no. And that's, that's how, you know, that's, that's how I lock down. Um, there may be I like this. other simple-ish solution. And that would be to run Beehive inside a VNet enabled jail. Right. And then I don't have. Because then you have a new loop back. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I, I can protect that from post. Exactly. Post you would have to enter access. that unless there's an e pair to turn to and then a proxy or not to basically make it available. Um, you could just. Let it run on a in its own VNet enabled jail, and that doesn't mean that you have to do, go through an e pair for the Beehive guest Ethernet packets because uh, frames because the you can still use the same uh, top devices because Beehive doesn't use the top interface. Um, yeah, the only problem is in. All currently released and supported versions, this, there will be a problem with the code which tries to bring the tab interface up. Um, so there's code in Beehive, which uh, is certainly not properly documented, that Beehive does no longer rely on a CCTL to make, uh, have tab interfaces come up uh, automatically when opened. Instead, it uses um, uh, either IPv4 or IPv6 socket, whatever is available, uh, to invoke an octal on the socket to bring the interface up. The problem with that is uh, that you cannot use this mechanism to bring it up across VNets. Um, so yeah, the tab interface character device Beehive uses would work, but this code would then explode so your in 14, with the patch alert, it should work. Um, because then it just invokes an iOctal directly on the tap device and not uh, on a socket. So, yeah, but that remains to be tested, but it just, it should work. Good solutions all around. Uh... Just try it on 14 RC4. Uh, it's the RC3 and you should uh, include the, uh, the bug fix to make it work. But I would recommend taking 14 uh, RC4 uh, or 40, RC4 P1. Uh, Jan, if there is a short path on jailing and giving, say, a nice limited access to that VNC server, that would be great. So I, I welcome your thoughts there. Sure. It's anything left else? as an exercise to the reader. Yes. Uh, anything else <laughs> on remote uh, consoles, for lack of a better term? Because that's a, a long-term topic, and it's um, a good time post-14 release to just think about what's next to improve that. So one thing to watch out for is that Anything which deserves to be exist in a server context should be able to just use a serial console. Uh, and oftentimes it's a lot easier to just forward access to the guest serial console via SSH or some other mechanism, and you, then you don't need a fancy web interface to act as spice, RDP, VNC, or whatever client. You just need SSH and you get a console. Uh -huh. uh, that's really a few lines of shell to do, maybe a few lines more to do it well 
automatable and secure mm-hmm. with multi-tenancy support. But yeah, it's there. And maybe you can have either um, a force command or something else, whatever you want. Um, there are lots of mechanisms available which can be basically used to demultiplex the incoming SSH connection right. to the right serial console. Hmm. Cool. So uh, <laughs> anything else on that? Let's kind of keep that long term because that's an issue that's not going away and is very much of interest to production and users. And it so sounds for like... For FreeBSD and Go for uh, anything Linux, it's it for the reasonable distributions if you don't have a vga console it just should default to that mm-hmm. for some others you need to do a minimal amount of configuration to have the it ex- accept that there is a virtual machine without a vga and then you have your system console on the fir- on com1 basically the first yep. legacy serial port and yep. you can use it to interface with the UEFI boot code, you can use it to interface with the bootloader, you can use it to uh, log in and do initial network configuration. Okay. Vitaly, do we still have you? We do. So it sounds like, Chris, you have organized the reviews relating to live migration. Here we go. I see a beautiful table there. And someone's been kindly... Is that magically auto-generated so that these get updated when it's tickled? Or no, you're sitting copying and pasting? Unfortunately not. Yeah, I'm copying and pasting here. Yeah, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, so, Vitaly, if that saves a bunch of trouble on your part of organizing these, thank you. If you want to put these in a different order, let us know. Um, yeah, a lot of moving parts. Um Hmm. Yeah, some of them are already uh, completed. For example, uh, Capsicum integration. Uh, I finished it in June, I think. Was that committed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Currently, Beehive uh, in, uh, support Capsicum. Okay. Chris, are you willing to hand out selective editing? Because I can't fix like the. Yeah, big... oh, sure. Uh, sorry, you. of course. Uh, I'll. Post that in the link. Hold on a second. Uh, um, okay, then yeah, maybe Chris, if you want to run through these and just if you created it, go ahead and yeah, absolutely fix those. Multiple cool. multiple support support for multiple devices. Also, I finished that uh, also probably in May or June. Let's see what this. Does. I'll reload. Sorry okay. about that, everyone watching. Uh, I don't know if uh, Vitaly, you're watching my screen or your own, but yeah, let's go back to the table. And from a conversation yesterday, Antrenig noted he's the most recent uh, changer on uh, VMB Hive. So uh, and, uh, snapshot safe and ahead. restore multiple devices. Uh, let's see. Upper, 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 upper. Multiple devices. Uh, yeah, the first, one. the first one. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it uh, it uh, was finished and integrated also. Okay. Great. Um, so I, <laughs> what we need to uh, discuss uh, some truth format for just one file. Uh, probably implemented in the in release and um, added release support. Uh, and the sustaining tools like analyzing snapshot file and uh, uh, internals uh, to uh, to to help debugging and find find some uh, where problem is uh, and uh, after that we can uh, and uh, then uh, the primitives for live migration for example dumping pages and uh, something related, different pages, and then uh, implemented via war migration and life migration, I think. So uh, I, I vote to to do it step by step. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I take it an analysis tool means 
here's a snapshot. This is compatible with the CPU or not, and I can attempt to launch it or. You mentioned analysis tools. No worries. So yeah, uh, let's try to centralize either here or somewhere else and be very clear on the status of these and what's next. Uh, reviews are your friend. They are not perfect, but they are a great way of tracking what's going on. Michael, so I also other... posted the link to, to the mailing list conversation about the file format because there was also a lot of stuff being discussed there. And I think that is also probably uh, important to understand what's going on here because it's kind of a side conversation yeah. happening in parallel. Uh, just one sec, let me put that in there. Uh, note this mailing list discussion. And this is where we all have to be on the same page or else we're wasting everyone's time at- Exactly, yeah. A very large amount of money per hour if you were to work out what we all could, should, could or should be doing according to our bosses. So. Um, let me get that in there for documentation. Just a sec, push some buttons, push some foam, and let's take a look, friends. Boom. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, image format, Quarterfren, great. Matthew, yes. Ah, I know Matthew rightfully lit a fire saying, look, where are we at? We've been, you know, trying to make this happen. Oh, here we go, actual format. NV list data, possible free space. Who proposed that? That is Corvin responding. Ba, 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 ba. I propose it. <laughs> okay, excellent. Yes. And was this a constructive discussion as it unfolded? Yeah, it partly, uh, partially was constructive and uh... It's just, uh, I put uh, just uh, current uh, things that we have uh, in our production and uh, uses uh, to, uh, for example, to migrate uh, from uh, FreeBSD uh, 13.1 to FreeBSD 13.2 uh, okay. virtual machines uh, without interruption. Because um, we use and released and released and uh, yep. it uh, allows to to use key values uh, and the debugging if something uh, goes wrong. Uh, look into image and uh, find uh, what uh, values uh, are used and uh, what's wrong. Uh, Would it be worth continuing this conversation with your latest news, if any? Okay. And I, I think I think I think I need to uh, implement, uh, for example, in the list uh, in the list implementation and uh, create uh, review for that. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, we, uh, yeah, it's a huge, huge code changes, and we can after that look. Uh, is it fine or not? How far along is that work, and how can we help as a group? Sorry. How how com how far along complete is that work, and how can we help you as a group? Um. Uh, um. Uh, I think it needs some time to uh, to uh, move co code from thirteen point two okay. uh, to the latest FreeBSD code, and uh, maybe two weeks probably. Okay, well, keep us posted, and we're happy to help however possible. Be it, I'm happy to help with wording of your review. I'm happy. I hope that group is willing to review whatever you have as a structure. There have been many discussions of NV list support throughout the ecosystem. So yes, let us know how we can help. 
And this has come up a few times for those using ePairs. Jan has produced an ePair helper. And that's it. If anyone said, wants to look at it, I would welcome reviews or just recommendations to add missing features because maybe there is something I overlooked, but I think it does what is needed. Uh, that had usage, as I recall, because you were being nice and responsible, eh? Let's see. Uh, yes, usage, thank you. So yes, everyone, even that alone, see if that makes sense to you. Um, yeah, that's the important part there on a single screen. Great. So uh, the idea is that it can dynamically allocate a new ePair so that you don't have to hard code them in your Beehive or Gel configurations. And then it can rename either side. You can assign the method address. Uh, all of this can happen inside of jails. Uh, then you can throw one or both ends or none uh, on a bridge, assign them to groups to make it easy to find them again. Um, you can also use dash i or dash uppercase i to uh, run your custom if config on them, which will already be prefixed in such a way that it will attach to the jail, but that functionality only works in 14, where the if config command can attach to a jail. Uh, maybe note that in the somewhere in the docs that if it's 13 or 14 dependent or hypothetically 15. Um, feedback, um, welcome. Note the usage. So it's mostly useful for EPL setups. Uh, so probably not that important for Beehive because now we're there, you don't use Beehive and VNet, but if you do, it's there. Okay. Any questions for Jan at this time or feature requests or kind words? Those are important to you. Okay, everyone, we are at one hour. Are there any other topics you want to bring up? Um, related to this little script, I uh, wrote it and then a similar one for uh, non EPR clonable interfaces because when trying to use supervision for jails and uh, Beehive, I found, found again, and now I can probably articulate the problem that, yes, I'm familiar with the FreeBSD command and interface and they can use it, but it's not as too automation friendly as it could be, or in my opinion also should be, because lots of commands lack an idempotent mode, where if the result is already accomplished, they just tell you that the result has been accomplished uh, and are happy. So for example, if config interface name up, you can run two times. If you do the same with a if config tab zero create, uh, the second one will fail. Yes, you. Uh, for those who missed the jail call, I believe you had some very good uh, syntax examples of when if config is your item potent friend and when it is not. Most of the so, time it is not. It is not. So yeah, and I owe you that if check uh, code. But if check I I'll I'll let you know what that is. Um anyway, so yeah, for those who want to deep dive into that, almost we need a call dedicated to getting in the weeds there. So uh great work, Jan. Do you think your various helpers will reside in one location or uh, just a bunch of gists or are they suitable for base at some point? What what do those look like in the long term? Uh, I don't have any plans, so they will just float around unless someone bothers to pick them up. Okay, well... Uh, or until they become part of something large enough to be worth uh, distributing. Understood. Okay, so... Uh, do you have a gist of the non epair script, the, the complementary one you just mentioned? The similar one. 
they could always go into share examples. Not wrong. As no, long as someone gives them some light from time to time. Because, uh, <laughs> because I didn't upload the interface script because it's still in flux. So yeah. Okay. Cool. But the idea is that you can use this like. Uh, Okay, anything else at this time? Or I'm going to call it. So some the syntax I use is something like this. And so okay. the lower KC uh, assigns a variable to which cloner to use, then it will look at the interface to a clone, find that, oh, this is not cloner and uh, decimal non-negative number. So I will not immediately create it, but clone and rename. If the rename fails, it will clean up and check if through a race condition, someone else did the same thing at the same time. So if there is a, um, if the uh, interface um, exists and is in the group indicating that it has been cloned from the cloner we want, then it's happy and continues. And then I register which bridge I want to inter add my interfaces to with lowercase d. And then I tell it to add a member to the last bridge I mentioned. So okay. now, uh, and, be, and this is useful for bridges as well because those are just cloned interfaces. Okay. So you can use it to also make sure the bridge exists. Keep us posted, please. So, yeah. so that said, anything else at this time, or shall we call it and move on with our days and weekend? Happy Veterans I Day. I have a quick after meeting question yes. for the experts online. Is it not something to share openly in the recording? Uh, it's not directly about Beehive. Okay. Let's call it there. I'll be a few around a few minutes to address that question and others. Thank you everyone for joining and I will kick this off. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.